I'm Rusty Lindsay, joined with head football coach Mike Swider, and coach it's kind of been, I'm sure, an emotional week for you Almost, since you've yeah. you've announced your retirement this week. What's what has kind of been the emotions coming out of this since the announcement went public on oh, Tuesday? Oh man. Well, first, Rusty, it's just great to be here with you. I was just saying a minute ago how we've done a lot of interviews over the years, pre-game, post-game, and this will probably be the last one, but we're we're pretty good at this, not because we're good at what we do, but because we're used to being with <laughs> we each other. Here. <laughs> we're yeah. So I, I really count this a privilege, and I, I want to thank you for this opportunity, Rusty, and and for all the way you and Wheaton College have promoted football. Um, yeah, first Saturday was was really hard. Saturday when you know when I walked off that field, uh, first how we lost was brutal. It was absolutely brutal, Rusty. We all know it. We saw it. I mean, the number of things that just didn't go our way that went wrong, and some of them almost uncontrollable. So how we lost was brutal, and then what it cost us. Oh my gosh! I mean, we were good. We had a good football team. And we were going to be home, you know, and semifinals, and and uh, so then you compound with what it cost us, and then only I, but I knew my wife that that was the last time I was walking off the field, and you saw me in the press conference at the end, and you had those three things together. It was like a dagger through my heart. I'll just be honest with you, Rusty. It was probably the hardest. I, I really didn't know how to manage anything at that time. And I was fighting not to say or do or be someone that would embarrass myself or the college or the program. But I'll just be honest, I was hurting. I was really, really hurt for those three reasons. And uh, But just like anything since then, you and we can talk about it here, how you manage it and how you move forward. But um, you start seeing the big picture. You start realizing, remembering why you do what you do and why you did what you did for 42 years total, 35 years at Wheaton. And you start hearing some people talk to you about the impact you've had and you start readjusting your priorities again. <laughs> and eventually you work your way through it. But yeah, and we can get into detail here shortly, but it was, it was hard. It really was. Um, and, uh, but. It was a great ride. My wife hugged me at the end of the game and she said, Mike, it's been a great life. And uh, we've been able to raise our three children here. And uh, I've been able to be the type of husband and father I wanted to be, as well as be a football coach, and so I'm grateful. I'm sure you've heard from probably hundreds of people oh, since, yeah. <laughs> since the announcement went public. How, yeah. I mean, how's the yeah. outreach been? And, and talk a little bit about just what, oh, what yeah. that's been in, in the aftermath of. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, obviously you're going to get um, players, former players that have just that reach out. And the volume of those is, is right. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds already. And my email is, is, is becoming overloaded. And I, as you well know, I got an old flip phone. That thing just is smoked right now. That, it just starts smoking the other day. I mean, seriously, I thought I had it charged up, and I charged the whole thing up. And on like 98% charge, it just started breaking down. <laughs> Part of it because the phone's not good, but yeah, it's 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 been unbelievable. And I mean, from way back. Um, but here, just recently, I've started to have a few wives of former players who've shot me an email and gone, "Thank you for my husband. Thank I think Wheaton football for who my husband is." For the father that he is, and you just go, whoa, that sort of helps the loss a little bit because <laughs> it's an eternal perspective. And so I'm just going, man. And then you know what I've had even more recently now? A few sons and daughters who said, thank you for my dad. I think we eat football for my father. Whew. Yeah. Those are, those are little blessings and gifts from God that have helped me, but to answer your initial question there, yeah, the, the, the outreach and the outpouring has just been off the charts. And then, obviously, people that are not even directly associated, people in the community, coaches that are all over, um, and other sports. And you really see how Wheaton football has just transcended not only Wheaton community, but around, and that starts to overwhelm you. And 
and it's a way for God to to shed His grace on me and help me manage the, the immediate pain. And I, I've said this, it was in the the press release that was released by Wheaton College, that if, that if one half of one percent of Mike Swider is left in the lives of my players, then I've done what I wanted to do, because that that will be left in someone else. And it just transcends the program then. And they leave it, and they leave it. And that's how you change the world or change culture, because you, you leave something of yourself in someone, you affect their life, and then they take that, and within their own personality, they leave that, and then they pass it on. And that little part of you, or that little motivation from you, or ideas, or your philosophy, it gets passed on. And uh, that's how you change the world, change culture, or leave a legacy. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And, and God's blessed me with this, this outpouring. And, and uh, it's been heartwarming. Take, take for, I'm sure, it's, obviously some people knew behind the scenes, but kind of take yeah, us through oh it, yeah. through the decision. And you, you, said that, Great question. you said that you've known since the beginning of the year, and Saturday didn't change any of that, even though I'm sure there's some temptation given, no, how, it ended, but, that. given the, how it ended. But kind of take us through the, the process that got you to where you, you knew this would be your last year. Woo, yeah. Um, several things. I've said this many times that, you know, as... Within the last year, you know, from the end of last year, and as the months went on the off season, if someone were to play for me 25, 35 years ago, were to come in and see me, they would say he hadn't changed one bit. In fact, they say that. They say, you haven't changed <laughs> one bit, coach. You still, you don't cut your hair and you don't shave often. But, you know, they, they, you haven't changed. And your energy, your enthusiasm, your passion, your emotion, it, it hasn't changed at all. And it hadn't. But where I saw a difference was when I went home. <laughs> it took longer for the battery to charge up. And and so I wasn't as good at home. You know, with time and energy and emotion, even my own children sometimes I felt like, whoa, man, I'm I need to recharge. And so when I got home ten years ago, I could give them the same energy passion they gave here, but I needed a chance that when I get home I just say, okay, just Give me 20 minutes here, or, and I go, wow, that's, I'm not so sure that's the way it should be. And so that started me thinking, you know, am I, am I who I should be at home all the time? And, uh, and I started thinking longer and harder about that. And then I said, you know, but boy, you know, the wins, we could win this and win that. And, and my wife challenged me and she said, well, what are you in this for? And so then when the season began, I, I looked at her and I had been praying about it and I got some peace and I said, this is going to be it. And so then she would ask me, you know, you know, why are you going to make your, how are you going to make your announcement? You know, a lot of people will make it a year in advance or before the season. And uh, so people can say goodbye to them, you know, whether you're on the road or where people can say goodbye and you can let people know. And, and I told her, I said, that's not who I am. I said, I'm not going to turn the season into a circus. I'm not going to turn the season into a farewell party. I'm not going to turn the season into Mike Swider. For 35 years, Rusty, I built Wheaton football on the premise that it's not about any one person. This is about Wheaton football. This is about a cause that transcends all of us. And I'm not going to make a mockery of 34 years and lose the respect of all my players if in my last year I do everything that I said it's not. And I turn every game into my last game. And every senior on that team now knows what his coaches, as they exit the field, well, this is coaches last. They're winning it for coach. I mean, it's baloney. It's not about me. It's never been about me. And I wasn't going to make the season about me. And so I told him, I told my wife, I said, when the season ends, you know, on that Tuesday after, I'm going to get into the science lecture hall, our room where we always meet with 111 players and my 10, 12 coaches. And that's what I'm going to tell them. With nobody around. And I said, it's going to be really hard because it's going to hit everybody like a ton of bricks. But I said, that's the room where it's going to happen. And uh, wow, I mean, the emotion in that room, I mean, 
I, I, I struggled for that 30 minutes, and the players struggled, and it was about as emotional a room as I had ever been part of. But that's where it should have happened. It shouldn't have happened in public. And so I'm really happy with that. And, uh, but that's how it sort of went down. And then you asked, and it's been asked me a lot, did you ever question it during the season? You bet I did. I'll tell you when I questioned it. Every Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> every Saturday night, we'd win, and it was like a drug. It was just like a high. It was just like, yeah, I could do this again. <laughs> you know, you get the bell. You win the conference title. Oh, yeah, bring it, man. I know why I'm doing this. And, it was, and then all of a sudden, the week, Monday would show up and Tuesday would show up, and the same reason why I said no started to get me again. And, uh, and I found myself saying the same thing. The only reason I would continue would be for a selfish reason is, yes, this feels good. And that's not the right reason. And so the last game was that magnified even more. So you, you lose like you do. And you realize what it's cost you. And then in my mind, I know, we'll talk about this in a second, what's coming back next year with eight 50 or eight 50 year seniors 25 seniors, you know, returning quarterback. I mean, some dudes on both sides of the ball. And I'm saying to myself, doggone, we didn't get this year. We will get it next year. <laughs> I said, I'm coming back. <laughs> and, and then at the end, I realized that why am I coming back? So I can get more wins. So I can feel better about myself. And then my wife helped me again. My dear wife, is she's really smart. And she said, you know, Mike, when you lose a game like that, that's just God saying, you know, it ain't for you. Too many crazy things happen. And she said, here's the deal. And it's so, it's so true, Rusty. Your job, look at yourself like Moses. Your job was to get Israel. Take them out of Egypt, through the desert, and your job was to get them on the brink of the promised land, like you did this year. But that's not your job. That's someone else's job. Moses never got in there. It was Joshua's job. And that's not bad. It was just not your assignment. Your assignment was from 1985, the state of the program then, to 2009, or excuse me, 19, in the state of the program now. And that was your assignment from God. David wanted to build a temple, didn't he? She tells me. But he didn't get to build a temple. His job was to defeat the surrounding countries, and he had blood on his hands. I'm not saying he was blood on my hands. <laughs> but it was Solomon's job. No matter how bad David wanted to build a temple, that was not the job God had for him. That was Solomon's job. And she said, Mike, the way that game ended up, we all prayed, and I'll tell you, my two sons and my daughter and I, we prayed every week that we could do it this year. And when it didn't happen, my wife and I said, that wasn't God's plan. That, that's the bottom line, Mike. And that's going to be someone else's job. And that helped me. You know, to realize that, you know, there was purpose in me being here for 35 years, from 1985 to take the state of the program, whatever it was, you can define it however you want to define it. And to have what it is now with the culture and the winds, whatever it is, that was my job. And so I said, thank you, Lord, for the assignment you gave me, and you know, hopefully I fulfilled it, and we'll leave this for someone else. And. Um, and so then I said to myself, and I told my wife this, I said, you know, it's even making more sense to me now, Rusty. I've preached team, 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 and we've had players come and go, seniors and come and go, great players come and go, Studebakers, the Sagans, you know, they all, they all come and go. Coaches come and go in my 35 years. Come and go, people take them, coach, otherwise they come and go. And every time someone would come and go, a senior class, a coach would come and go, I said, listen, man, it's no big deal. 
anything about that. With all due respect to all those players and coaches, this program is bigger than that. When there's a program, it's not because of one person. And I told my wife, I said, here's the greatest thing and the greatest testimony for this program as I was looking up who's coming back to. Was these guys to win it the year after I leave? That's what I'm praying for us now. What a testimony to Wheaton football. That they win it the year after. Well, here, here's a guy who's been there 35 years, whatever. For Wheaton, I'm sure the outside world's saying, oh, they're going to take a hit. That program's going to take a little hit. There's going to be a vacuum there. And I said, no, it's not going to be any vacuum. It's never been about me anyhow. It's never been about any of these players. And I've told everyone on our football team, our kids, I said, you know what I want you guys to do? I want you to win it without me, man. I want you to win this thing the year after I leave. Win it all! And that would be the greatest testimony to my 35 years. It would prove that Wheaton football transcends any human being because it's a team and it's a program and it's a culture. So now I'm going to pray that they win it again. But it's not going to be a selfish prayer. My prayer this year was selfish. I wanted to win. <laughs> I was praying, I wanted to win this because I knew it was my last year. And you know what I'm doing now? I'm praying that they win it again to prove to the world that teams and cultures and organizations win. And it's not about one guy. And nothing would make me happier, Rusty, for these guys to win in 2020. And they're capable. There's a good team coming back. You talk about culture, and we'll kind of get to you building the culture here in a second, but obviously your family knew going into this, yeah. and, and you talk about your wife being there after Saturday's game. What was what was it like for you to go through this last season with your family yeah. knowing, obviously everybody knowing and getting to experience that yeah. together with your sons and your daughter and even your grandsons? Yeah, oh yeah, you could see Justin bringing his grandson by more often just to see their grandpa. On the field, you probably saw him after games, he'd be more, more visible, and even in practice he's dragging by, and and uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, it, they, they didn't miss anything. My wife didn't. And it was really funny because my daughter Hannah uh, plays in our basketball team. In that last game, they had to go down to Millican. And uh, that was really hard on her. You know, not only she, she obviously there's a chance that you're not going to play again. And she loves her dad. And she went down there and she says, Dad, I, I just wish I could be with you, man. And, uh, and she loves basketball, you know, it's just, it's just a father-daughter thing. And even Coach Matson said that, you know, they could tell she was struggling, you know, and then of course the game, their game starts, and, you know, when the game ended, uh, and she had heard that we lost, it was, uh, yeah, it was really hard on her. That was, you know, just to feel that, I'll just share that with our audience here. That, yeah, actually, she texts me from the bus as they're coming back from Milliken and she says, I'm crying, I'm sobbing, Dad. She says, I wasn't there for you. I wasn't there in your last game. I wasn't there for you, Dad. And you were there for everything for me. And so so you ask you how was it like to go through with my family? It was great until that last. Gus <laughs> <laughs> one, Justin and Mikey too. But the hardest one was my little dear Hannah. I couldn't be with my dog. But. God is still sovereign. He's still good. You, when you came back here and and you kind of took over under Jr. Bishop, what 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 was it that you took away from from Jr.'s time leading this program, and what what did Jr. kind of instill to help yeah. to help set you up to build the culture into what it is today? Yeah. Well, Jr. Well, he was a great man on so many levels. Um, but here's the thing that if, if JR showed me one thing, it was taught me, it took me 11 years to learn it. <laughs> it was the ability to delegate. You know, I'm obviously high strung with ideas and focus and I want to do things this way, this way. And, and he said, Mike, one thing you never want to do is you don't want to limit the scope of the program just to your ideas. And if you try to do everything, it'll only be your program. And then all that will happen is people just do what you tell them to do. You want to give the people under you great freedom. Because now, not only is not only your vision, but it's their vision too. 
And as long as those visions are not selfish, but are collectively team-oriented vision, you expand your ability to make change and to do great things. And so I was JR's right-hand man for 11 years, and, and I'm telling you right now, he never even told me what to do. He just let me go. He just said, go, work, do whatever you want to do. I trust that you're driven not by yourself, but I trust that you're driven by this organization. So just literally, just turn me loose. And didn't worry, and didn't have any ego, like he's going to trump me. Or and when I became the head guy, I said, man, I said, the worst thing I can do now is just say, okay, now it's my program. I got these ideas. Just limit it to that. Just make sure people do what I say. No, empower people. And just make sure that everyone that you empower is driven not by their advancement and their agenda, but by the agenda of the organization. And so just hire people you trust. Surround by people who are trust that are driven by the organization. And then cut them loose. Don't just wait for them to come in and give an order. And JR never felt threatened by me. He totally trusted me. I had more responsibility than any other guy ever. And it was unbelievable. He had no ego. Had no ego. And so those were some of the things that JR passed on to me. And, and uh, for 11 years I worked for him, from age 30 to 40, basically. And uh, yeah, he was a humble, selfless guy that gave me great, great autonomy and great freedom, and never felt threatened. And those were probably the best things that he shared with me. Do you, you kind of see that as a testament to JR doing that to you and how many weak football players are now coaches and how many of, of your alums have, oh. have even come and gone in the last recent yeah. years and are leading other colleges and high schools right. all over the nation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, more than you could ever imagine. And that's the same thing because you empower them. And, and hopefully they're doing things similarly to what we do. Obviously their own personality can, and can play a role in that. But, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll all call you and... You know, it's you know, it's just amazing. Sometimes when they call you, sometimes they'll call you up, and I, I get a call from a former player, and it'll be Pedro down in Randolph Bacon. Say, hey, coach, I got a question for you. My my answer always is, is it a coach question or is it a dad question? Because <laughs> they'll sometimes call you and say, hey, how'd you handle this with Justin? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, they're out in their own place. How'd you handle this with Mikey? You know, and. And um, so, yeah, as you see these guys with what they're doing, you know, around the world, and the one thing they are taking is that they are, they are, they have this idea, this, this concept of team, 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 cause, 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 empower people to play that out as long as they're not serving themselves. The ones you get, you can't trust. If you hire someone, you get some of your staff, and their their decisions are driven by advancement or by glory or personal something. That's the one you got to get rid of. And that's the one you can't trust. You don't empower. But if you trust their motives, let them go and empower them. And, uh, uh, and so that's what these guys have done. And they've done it around the, around the country at all levels. And they've been very, very successful, too. You mentioned what you do with Justin or Mike. You, yeah. you talked in the press release about seeing Wheat through every lens possible, as a player, yeah. as a coach, yeah. as a father. What, oh. what are the what are, what are the, the differences you yeah. see in, in how you approach even coaching your own sons yeah. and, and getting to see them experience week football? Yeah, it's had a profound influence on my family. Profound influence. It's uh here's the number one thing that Wheaton has done for my my children, especially my two boys, but for my daughter to a certain extent as well. You know, when you're a father and you're trying to teach your kids and steer them in a particular direction. I always say there's, there's a little bit of defiance in every 13-year-old. No matter how good they are, there's, we all are. There's a built-in defiance, built-in question. And so I would share things and I would try to teach them things and they would go, well, you're my dad. You're, you know, it's, it's, you're supposed to say that. You know, you're supposed to do these things. You know, you're my dad, you're my co whatever. But my two sons saw a lot of things I was trying to instill in my kids modeled by other 18 to 22 year olds. They weren't their dad. So they were to hang out, they would go hang out with Andy Studebaker when he's a player. They'd go hang out with Pete. I just mentioned them because 
I mentioned earlier, or whoever, Colin Sinclair, you know, any, I, any of these guys. And so I would come home on a Friday night, and I'd be 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock, whatever it is, and I'd say, where, where are the two boys? And you'll say they're 8 and 6. And you know what my wife would say? Well, they're over at that house where all the football players live. <laughs> <laughs> I go, where in America does that happen? That an eight and a six year old on a Friday night at 10 o'clock are hanging out in an outside residence home with a bunch of 20 to 22 year olds. And I looked at my wife and I said, Ain't no better place for them to be. <laughs> and free babysitting. Yeah, yeah. I just went, Wow. And what I would try to do as a dad, they were seen modeled by 18 to 22 year olds. I'm eternally grateful eternally grateful. And yeah, you know, there's just something about your your boys and even my daughter seeing it in, in our players. Saying that man, young people also live this way as well and try to. And so it's been a huge, huge blessing on my family. And and my kids just hanging around the practice field and and all over. It's, it's been tremendously impactful. You come into this knowing it's your last year, and then yeah. the year unfolds the way it does, where you guys reach number three That's in the cool. country. You lead the country in a number of statistical categories. Were you able to kind of, as it's happening, pull away a little bit and get the big picture of of getting to enjoy what this actually yeah. was for what was what could arguably be the best season of program history? Oh, no doubt. Yeah, it was magical. It really was. and. And knowing it was my last year, I intentionally did what you asked, what you just said there. And I, and I said, well, maybe, maybe not. I would not have embraced it because I would say, well, there's always next year. But knowing that it was, oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, every time I walk on the practice field, I said, just make this moment count. And so, you know, those wins and, and those bus rides and all of it, I just really tried to soak it in. And, you know, my wife came to more practice than she's ever been, just sitting in the stands. And like you said already, my sons came and brought my grandsons, and, and my daughter even would come and watch some practices. And so we did. We really did try to absorb it and and take it all in and, and enjoy it and just enjoy the process. Um, it really was. And, in, and when you look at it, because we did, we let in so many categories, we were good. And, and that's why, like I said, that last game, I mean, I really believe in my heart, and I think when this whole thing is done and the, the national championship is crowned, I think I, I, I think the football world is going to see how good we were. I mean, we were ranked three for a reason. That wasn't, we weren't imposters. We really weren't. I mean, we were good enough to win this thing. And I'm just going to say that. We didn't win it, and I understand that. We got beat, okay, whatever it is. But we were good enough. This football team was good enough. And Wherever we were in our rankings, it was legitimate. It was legitimate ranking. Did you find that as things were happening throughout the year, you kind of get flashbacks? So, be able to enjoy these things that kind of remind you of 10, 15, yeah. 20 years ago. I mean, you've been going head to head with with Norm Ash for years, yeah. and other coaches around the conference that you get these these memories from previous games oh, and yeah. previous practices and players that have come and gone and. And those things come back to you a little bit more as you kind of yeah. take that big picture approach. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, I can remember going to Augustana, and now we're on opposite sidelines. A few of the schools now we're on opposite sidelines. I can remember, oh yeah, flashbacks. I can remember in 1986 playing Augustana, and they, they won two of their four already of their four consecutive national titles, and we're playing in there, and we. We get beat on a field goal. They kick a field goal with 11 seconds left to beat us 18-17 and go on and win the national title. And that kept us out of the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, you get, you start remembering stuff as you go there and these memories flood you as you, you play these people and, 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 and some of the battles obviously we've had it with the Illinois West scene and then all the wars we've had with North Central recently. And you know, those things come back as you go there and you just go, wow. You know, how many games, and there's a ton of games, 260 games as a head coach, and then how many more in the other 11 years, another 110 games? You know, that's 360 games. 
All kinds of memories flood you. Some painful, and I remember going to that same August Anfield field in, in 03 and 04 and winning in the last second to win conference titles. I mean, to win the conference title in the last second of the game in 03 and 04 on that same field where we lost it. I remember on that field in 2000, us winning in double overtime to win a conference title. So there are some that are really, really exhilarated, and then there's some that are very, very painful that that come up as you go to to a lot of these stadiums and play a lot of these teams. But there, when there's 350 games or so that you've been involved in, uh, there's a lot of memories that got the capacity to be triggered in your mind. You talk about those memories coming back, and, and obviously those will be the things you take sure. after you clean out your office and right. all this is done. But what are what are some of the well, things? That's a hard one to think right. about. Right. <laughs> what, what are some of the things you anticipate probably missing the most about yeah. about Wheaton and about this job? Yeah. Well, I, I think you hear it said all the time when players retire. You hear you know when major league baseball players or NFL football players retire, and you know, they always say that the relationships. And I know it becomes a pretty trite statement, but there's it's said all the time and it's true. I've always said when you hear something repeated all, all a lot of times, it's probably because it's true. You know, and I think that's the thing you'll 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 miss the most, the daily interaction with players, um, and with coaches and young coaches. You know, I've said all the time that you know you influence occurs and relationships are built around four things. Uh, inspiring and encouraging people or being inspired and encouraged, and confronting and challenging people. Or being confronted and challenged. And that's that's the makeup of relationships. And and so I think back on all the players and the coaches, and I think about those relationships that were built, and I think about the inspirational and encouraging moments of those, and then sometimes the challenging when I had to challenge and confront. And uh, as I share with our younger coaches and I share with our players, that the key is about 70 to 80 percent of your discussion needs to be encouraging and inspiring. And about 20 to 30 percent may be challenging and confronting. I said when you challenge and confront, as you build these relationships and you do all this, if you're challenging and you're confronting, it starts to get to the 50-50 thing, people go into survival mode. Now they're just now listening to your challenge and your conf confrontation as you're trying to help them. They're just trying to survive. And if you're encouraging inspiration starts to morph more than 70 or 80 percent of the time, then you're, it doesn't mean anything anymore because it's never offset by anything that's not right. And so as I think of all the relationships and all these times spent with players, which is the most, I think of those moments in the, of challenging and confronting and encouraging and inspiring and, and, uh, and then I see the end product of what that did. That's what I'm going to miss, the ability to do that. It's not, I'm not going to, I mean, not that I didn't have fun doing it, but the X's and O's and the game planning, that's not what I'm going to really miss. I'm going to miss encouraging and inspiring a kid. I'm going to miss challenging and confronting him. Because I know what it's done. Because what the, been the product of that is all these phone calls that have showed up. Those phone calls are not a result of the X's and O's. They're not a result of that. Phone calls are a result of the relationship and the inspiration and the teaching that's occurred through this game of football and microcosm of football. So what's what's next for you then? Yeah. Maybe you haven't had a chance to look at this, no, but, but what's, what's next for you? Yeah. Wow. Um, well, one thing you have touched on it already, Rusty, is, you know, I really want to spend some time with my wife and my kids. Um, I mean, really genuine time and not have to worry. Sometimes I'd be spending time, but I wasn't even there. I mean, my mind was somewhere else. Even in the last week, as I've gone home, my conversation with my wife has been more relaxed. She says, you're not in a rush to go somewhere. You know, even sometimes I had to talk with her, she goes, okay, you're not even talking to me, your mind's somewhere else. And this week she says, it's one of the first times, not since they won the first times, but this, you know what you're doing right now this week more than you've done in third, you're listening. You're not waiting your turn to talk or to get on to something. I'm looking forward to doing that. You know, just being able to spend some time like that and 
And uh, yeah, a year ago I bought a little pop-up trailer. I like to pull that thing around and go out to the woods and sit down <laughs> and talk to the bears. <laughs> Travel a little bit with my wife and, and my children in the summertime and camp. We enjoy doing that. Um, uh, I, I really enjoy motivational speaking, leadership. I'd like to see if I can do more of that. I, I really enjoy speaking to groups, um, whether that's business related, high school graduations, you know, men's groups, you know, sales, sales, national sales seminars. I really enjoy doing that. Um, so I think that's something that I will spend some time doing. Uh, I've been asked to see if I would be interested in writing something, and so maybe not immediately, but down the road I have some ideas of maybe writing a book or something uh, on team building and motivation and leadership and getting people together to die to themselves and live for something that's bigger. Um, that's obviously, as you well know, that's something that's really important to me. I think it's something so countercultural. Um, you know, it's an idea that just that motivates you, that causes are these, you know, that's the greatest motivator in the world. I say this all the time that um, mercenaries, they'll fight, but they only fight long enough, so they still live so they can spend their money. So a mercenary's not going to fight to death. If someone's fighting for glory, they're going to fight long enough, they're going to quit a little early because they want to experience the glory. Someone who fights for causes, they fight to the death because the, the cause transcends their death. And even if they die, they die for something that's going to go on. I said, that whole idea of creating causes, I don't mean life and death causes, but to fight and rally around causes and ideas and to die to yourself, and these concepts and leadership and team building. And, uh, you know, I share them a lot verbally when I speak to groups, but I potentially want me to put that down on paper. And here's the thing I think I, I'd like to do too is how it plays out, I don't even know. I, I like to coach with my kids. And I don't mean be a head coach with them. I'm not <laughs> interested in that. And I don't mean being a coordinator with them. But have them just tell me what to do and show up on a field at 3.30 and have Justin say, hey, Dad, go get the outfield or some fungos. Okay, buddy, I'll get some fungos. <laughs> Catch the ball running in, okay? <laughs> you know, or go out on a practice field and Mikey say, hey, take those, take those corners and teach him how to play press man. Or maybe be up in a box on a Friday night and have a headset on and be talking to Justin and Michael. Or maybe being in a wrestling room and Mikey's coaching and, hey, Dad, Show that kid out of headlock somebody. <laughs> <laughs> or even my daughter. Be able to do some things with her too. Yeah. But be able to uh, have the freedom to choose those things. Something I'd like to be able to do. Well, Coach, we'll give you the last word yeah. here. What's, yeah. what's yeah. The, sure. the last thing you want to you want to tell people here is you kind of look at your yeah. last couple of weeks on yeah. the job. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for setting this up, Rusty. This has really been a blessing to me. Uh, first of all, I'm eternally grateful to Wheaton football, to Wheaton College and Wheaton football. It's allowed me. I, I say this all the time to our players when they go out to the workplace. Find a job that allows you to be the father and the husband you want to be. Don't take a job and then cram what the job allows you to be, the father and husband, into that limitation. And Wheaton football and Wheaton College have allowed me to be the father and husband that I want to be. Because if you fail, there you fail. And so I'm grateful to Wheaton for this community for allowing me to be that uh, and the influence it's had on my marriage and on my three children. And uh, I, am, I am really grateful to that. I'm grateful to all of our players uh, that have played for me, the coaches that have coached for me. Uh, they were men that wanted to be motivated. They were men that wanted to be challenged. They didn't take things personally. You know, they 
took things and, and, and reacted in a positive way to them. Uh, and then, you know, the last thing is, I, I, I say this to, to people all the time, you just don't ever forget who you are. And so my biggest pitch to, to Wheaton College, and I say this, don't ever forget who you are. Wheaton College is a conservative Christian college, and there's a sign that says, for Christ and his kingdom outside it. Don't round the edges off. When I recruit, I've recruited more athletes than anybody in the history of Wheaton College. I say that with all humility. First of all, no other sport recruits as many as I do. No matter what sport you're in, the coach is not recruiting as many as I do, just from a numbers thing, not because I'm good, okay? And nobody's been, no football coach, and so it's football. And no, no football coach has been as long as long as I have. So the mathematics tells you I've been in more homes, been on the floor more times than anyone else. My biggest fear is that Wheaton will lose its distinctiveness. I've never sold and got a kid to come because we're great academics. There's other schools that are more academic than we are. Let's just be honest. And there's schools that play better football, Notre Dame or whatever it is. But the one thing that I could say no one ever does is no other place stands for Christ and his kingdom as well as we do. Let's never compromise that sign and the principles and the core values of God's word. And when you recruit kids and you make decisions, go back and say, for Christ and his kingdom, and have the courage not to compromise in a world that is absolutely dying to make us compromise. And I would tell our players the same thing. Don't change, man. Don't, don't forget who you are and don't forget your core values. Um, I said it all the time to our players as they were playing. I said, you're, you're a football player at Wheaton College. You're not at some other school. I told my two kids, my three kids, they're growing up, your dad's a head football coach at Wheaton. Don't screw it up, man. <laughs> well, there's a sign on the front of the campus two Wheaton College as I'm speaking here, it says for Christ and his kingdom. No other school's got that in the United States. That was the greatest thing I had to sell. It was never athletics. It's not academics. It's that sign. Don't run the edges off.